get started now. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining me. Uh, my name is Jimena, and I work at the Outdoor Recreation Council, and I'm here to present on the impacts of outdoor recreation in rural BC communities. This is a research uh, study that I did this past year, and it was specifically looking into Burns Lake, Fernie, Revelstoke, Squamish, and Tofino as uh, case studies for, uh, for this research and for how, how to look at the impacts. All right, so I'll start off today by doing some land acknowledgements. And I'd like to recognize that I'm on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. I've also listed out here all of the other nations who have uh, territories in the five focus communities. And I'd also like to recognize their traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories. And I also want to recognize that um, their, their presence in um, BC for time immemorial and their role in land and resource stewardship that enable lots of the outdoor recreation opportunities that we have today uh, in, in BC. I'd also like to thank um, our financial supporters. So the Four Wheel Drive Association of BC, Eco Canada, and the province of British Columbia through the Ministry of Environment and Climate Stream to climate change strategy who uh, supported this research. And I'd also like to extend a really big thank you to all of our interviewees and research advisors who helped make this project possible. Right. So as I mentioned, I'll be going through a presentation today and at the end we'll have a Q&A uh, se session. And uh, on the agenda today, I'll be going over the research question of this research, the methodology behind it, then the large chunk of this will be results and discussion. And moving on to a few recommendations, key findings, closing remarks, and finally the uh, Q&A. Mm -hmm. So jumping right into it. Our research question was, what are the impacts of outdoor recreation in rural BC communities? And we really did this. Uh, we, we were asking this question because there's going to be some provincial uh, research coming out on participation and economic value of outdoor recreation. It will be to our knowledge quantitative and uh, province-wide in scope. And so to complement these efforts, we wanted to take a closer look at local impacts. And so we asked, what are the impacts of outdoor recreation for rural BC communities? And how we went about answering this question is through 25 semi-structured interviews with community leaders. So these are people in communities that had an oversight on the community or a certain part of the outdoor recreation sector that they could speak to uh, more broadly. And uh, we looked at five established outdoor rec communities, which I mentioned were Burns Lake, Fernie, Revelstoke, Squamish, and Tofino. And we chose these communities because not only do they have well-known outdoor recreation sectors, but uh, they also are geographically diverse and they have uh, different types of outdoor recreation activities available and also different population sizes. So we were interested in, in seeing a bit of diversity in the types of communities that we were looking at, but of course, focusing on uh, rural communities. And during these interviews, we asked questions on economic, community, equity, and environmental topics. Uh, and the research itself is very qualitative and exploratory in nature, which means that we were trying to measure the impact, but we were trying to identify different themes um, that were coming from these interviews and what the and it's based on what the interviewees have observed in their communities. So uh, from these interviews, we uh, did a thematic analysis on them, which means that we identified different themes from the different interview conversations and found common elements, uh, some similarities and some differences between them. And that's how this research is informed and how the following uh, results and discussions are informed. So what you will be seeing today are the themes that emerged from these conversations. And just because a theme didn't emerge, it doesn't mean that it didn't ex doesn't exist in that community. It just means it wasn't necessarily discussed by the interview participants uh, during the process of, of the of the interviews. And I'd also like to mention that uh, there were so many more people that we wanted to interview. And every time we finished an interview, we they, our list just kept growing and growing. Um, but unfortunately, we did have limited time and resources, so we did have to. Um, to, to stop it at one point, but there was always more that we wanted to learn. And so I think this is just a, a really great introduction to some of these impacts. 
So the first thing I want to talk about is three key elements that we saw across all five of the communities. And the first is easy access to outdoor recreation right out the door. So this is a comment and a sentiment that I heard a lot. Like, we have outdoor recreation right at our doorstep. You can access the trails five minutes from downtown. There's just in the five communities a sense of outdoor recreation being super accessible and present within the community itself. And there were also comments about how there's been rising interest in outdoor recreation um, and especially motivated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The second key element um, is outdoor recreation assets. So of course, all these communities have great outdoor recreation spaces like trails, oceans, uh, rivers where people can recreate on. And, and that's what, one of the similar points that they have. But what's interesting is that all of the outdoor recreation assets are somewhat different and unique for each community. So although they all have outdoor recreation assets, their assets are different. And the third key element is people accessing outdoor recreation assets. Uh, because you can have outdoor recreation assets, you can have easy access, but the, at the end of the day, you need people accessing them to have an outdoor recreation sector. And that would be the third key element. And, and together, I would suggest that this forms the basis of an of a outdoor recreation sector. And again, it's something we saw in all five of the communities. So with this in mind, we're going to jump into some of the impacts that uh, people discussed in the communities. And the first uh, section of impacts is land impacts. And these are impacts in outdoor spaces uh, or that are closely related to the outdoors. Um, and the first theme that emerged here is human caused damages to the land and its values. So when people visit outdoor spaces, they can cause damage to the land and associated values like environmental values or cultural values. And this can be done in two ways. One is through individual action. So an individual is going into an outdoor space, they are participating in an activity or doing something maybe they shouldn't be doing and their individual action can cause damage. So for example, they might be interacting with wildlife in a way that's not safe. And so that could cause um, human wildlife conflicts uh, in that area. The second way is even though everybody's being responsible, you could just have too many people going on the land and the not enough capacity to manage those people. And that is uh, overuse. And specifically discussed in the interviews uh, were all of these different impacts here. And I set them out in a table. Again, the ones that were identified in communities are ones that emerged through interview discussions, but just because they didn't emerge through those discussions, it doesn't mean that they're not in those communities. It just means they weren't talked about while, um, while we had those discussions. Um, and so, you can see some of the most common uh, concerns here are wildlife impacts, garbage, litter, and waste, trail erosion, and disrespect or lack of knowledge when participating in outdoor recreation activities. Uh, overuse or overtourism is also a big concern, as is dispersed or legal camping and van life, uh, of which uh, was talked quite a bit about in uh, Squamish and Tofino. Uh, this can all lead to closures of outdoor rec spaces, and uh, those closures aren't always being respected. And the final two points here are social media, which um, is just social media can influence some of the behaviors that people um, partake in when they are participating in outdoor recreation and can influence uh, what, what they're doing outside. And wildfire concerns were also something that was discussed. So we're looking at all of these negative impacts and you think, oh no, outdoor recreation is bad, but we actually heard a lot of great things about outdoor recreation. And the first thing is that really stood out to me was this connection to nature. So as people are participating in outdoor recreation, they are building connections to places and the outdoor spaces that they visit. And something that really stood out from these interviews was how people spoke about the outdoor spaces. So you'll hear uh, in, the, in the interviews, I heard people talk about personal enjoyment, happiness, even down to emotional well-being and healing experiences. And to me, this really showcases the deep connection that people were forming uh, to their community spaces. And as people build connection to nature, um, the interview evidence also suggests is that this motivates responsible recreation, stewardship, and education, which leads to the next positive income outcome, which is environmental stewardship. So environmental stewardship seems to take place uh, in three different ways. The first is the protection from human-caused damages, which we just talked about. And this is when people are seeing that damage is being caused to the outdoor places that they love, 
and they um, put in an effort to help protect them through education, through closures, or other uh, tactics. Another way environmental stewardship seems to take place is through the protection uh, from external forces, such as resource extraction. So for example, if a logging activity is set to take place in an area with a popular, popular trail, the outdoor recreation group might advocate for the protection of that trail, of that area, which could lead to, um, to less resource resource extraction in, in that area specifically. And that just shows how outdoor recreation is creating different values in the outdoor spaces. And the final one is a link between environmental stewardship and outdoor recreation. Um, it's actually led by environmental stewardship, and this is facilitating future outdoor opportunities. So in some cases, an environmental movement might protect an uh, environmental area, and in the future, it becomes an outdoor recreation space. So for example, if a stream is uh, being negatively impacted and it is later protected, then it might become a place for recreational fishing as a general example. And environmental stewardship was discussed in various ways. And again, here's another table illustrating some of those discussions. I'd like to point to the first one, which is indigenous environmental stewardship. And uh, again, point that this is what was discussed in the communities, and just because it wasn't discussed doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, but in these communities, Indigenous-led environmental stewardship was specifically discussed. But there are lots of other forms of outdoor environmental stewardship, so um, standards and authorizations are a common way that the outdoor spaces can be protected. Um, and we also saw things like community stewardship, environmental advocacy, and promotion of responsible recreation principles, which are often led by volunteers and volunteer groups. Tourism can also play a role in environmental uh, stewardship, and I'll speak to that a little bit later. And I will move on from that. All right, so Indigenous involvement. Uh, although Indigenous-led involvement was only extensively discussed in two communities, it, in, sorry, although Indigenous-led environmental stewardship was only extensively discussed in two communities, Indigenous involvement in the outdoor recreation sector was extensively discussed in all of the communities. So we heard that every community has unique relationships with their Indigenous communities. And also we um, heard that each nation, even within the same community, can have unique relationships. And that's something really important to keep in mind as people are working on outdoor recreation projects. Examples of Indigenous involvement that came up through these interviews was relationship building between First Nations and governments and relationship building between uh, First Nations and outdoor recreation groups and clubs. There's also Indigenous-led projects, participation in outdoor recreation uh, by Indigenous peoples, and consultations. The next uh, land impact is on natural resource values. And there are three ways that outdoor recreation can impact natural resource values. It's the coexistence, competition, or transition of them. And coexistence is when you have lots of values in the land base, such as uh, logging and outdoor recreation and cultural values and environmental values. And they're all coexisting in the same area. And the best example of this, in my opinion, is the Burns Lake Community Forest, who actively manages all of these values so that there's a um, good balance between them. And I got the sense in Burns Lake that the community um, seems to be quite con content with and satisfied with how that's being uh, managed. But these values aren't always uh, coexisting and they can enter into competition. And this is when only um, when you have to pick one value or the other. And that's something else that we heard about where uh, there's there's competition for these outdoor spaces. The final one is a transition of outdoor space of natural resource values. And we heard about how um, some communities such as Revelstoke uh, and Squamish and Tofino had extractive resource industries as their primary industry. And over time, as outdoor recreation became more popular or as the economic viability of these industries uh, became less uh, uh, secure, then uh, outdoor recreation can start to take the place of those, uh, of those industries. And you start to see that transition of, of resource values in the community. The next theme here is destination marketing and management. And um, so typically your destination marketing organizations are marketing um, 
the community so that visitors can come and enjoy it. And part of that is uh, marketing outdoor recreation spaces. Now, when that happens and the community is not, is not prepared to take on the amount of people that come in and they don't have the capacity to manage that, uh, it can cause some issues. And so we heard from several of these communities that destination marketing organizations are seeing a shift towards destination management, where they are not only promoting a space, but they're also taking care of it. So an example of this could be installing toilets in a busy outdoor recreation area so that there's not human waste uh, everywhere, but it has a designated spot to go to. The next line impact is knowledge and skills. So as people participate in outdoor recreation activities, they are developing skills such as uh, physical skills of uh, riding a mountain bike or hiking and knowledge of how to do that safely. But these skills are further enhanced as people join outdoor recreation groups or um, other community organizations where they can learn from others and, um, uh, and, and expand their knowledge of this. And what was really interesting about this is that as people become more involved in the outdoor recreation sector, they're not just learning about outdoor recreation, but they're also learning about the environmental values of the areas that they recreate in, the cultural uh, values such as um, the cultural indigenous values that are in those areas as well. Um, and even one interview participant um, spoke about how he was learning about land management um, through participation in outdoor recreation. Our next and final impact on land is inclusivity and accessibility. So again, as people begin to participate more in outdoor recreation and join groups and organizations, uh, you can start to see some more inclusivity and accessibility initiatives. And inclusivity initiatives are targeted towards underrepresented groups, such as maybe women, BIPOC, or LGBTQ, um, that include them in these activities and maybe teach them knowledge and skills that they might not have to be able to better participate in these activities. And we also see accessibility um, by way of making trails more accessible or creating beach access that's more accessible. And so participating in outdoor recreation at this level um, also creates more um, opportunities for others to participate. Now, as we're wrapping up here, these are this is the end of the land impacts. I <clears throat> want to point out that the first two are really at the individual level. So anybody that's going outside can cause damage to the land and to its values. And they can also connect to nature. And that happens at an individual level without uh, any other support, I would say. Uh, but I think from C to H, so those six points, those six impacts, they really start to happen uh, more frequently and are further enhanced um, as people participate in the organized outdoor recreation sector. And you might wonder, well, what do you mean by the organized outdoor recreation sector? So I mean the people that are maintaining and developing outdoor recreation spaces and protecting those values. So these could be your land or resource managers, your organized outdoor groups, uh, which are mostly volunteer led, indigenous peoples or destination management. So lots of those benefits I think come from the organized sector. So the next set of impacts here is our community impacts. And these are effects that take place in the community or for residents. So we're moving away from the outdoor spaces and now into the community and the people that are using outdoor spaces. And the first thing that I'd like to talk about is community culture and identity. This was something really interesting to see throughout the interview process. Hearing people talk about outdoor recreation and what it means to their communities. And here I've selected a few quotes um, that kind of help illustrate the sentiment that came across through these interviews. So culturally, it is a significant part of Tofino. Outdoor recreation is in essence what living in the North is all about. Outdoor recreation is our bread and butter, more and more so. Outdoor recreation is ingrained in everyone that lives here. Other than the outdoors, the town doesn't offer a lot of things, but it does offer a lot of outdoor activities that are completely endless. So I chose these quotes because I think they really illustrate how important these outdoor recreation spaces are for these communities. And I also want to talk a little bit more about this last quote here. Other than the outdoors, the town doesn't offer a lot of things. And this was a sentiment that came across in Tofino and in Burns Lake, which are the two smallest communities. And it's talking about how 
these small communities might not have access to the same urban comforts and amenities that larger communities have, but what they do have is outdoor recreation. And people that go live in those, in those communities are living there because of outdoor, uh, the outdoor opportunities that exist. And next we have impacts on lifestyle and well-being. So as people have easy access to outdoor recreation and there's a culture around participating in outdoor recreation, uh, more people are, are uh, participating in those activities. Uh, and so of course that uh, can have lots of positive health uh, benefits and, um, and uh, impacts on the way people are living their lives in these communities. A uh, comment that came out of a couple of the communities, for instance, was, oh, we, we have a lot of um, high level athletes here, much more than in other communities. And I think that speaks to some of the lifestyle and culture around um, participating in these type of activities. The next is social connection and community engagement. So again, as people are um, participating in outdoor recreation, it's creating a space for social connection. And this is really significant in those small communities where there might not be many other opportunities to do that. There is also opportunities for community engagement as people participate in outdoor recreation uh, groups and clubs. They're also, um, they also have better access to processes that help them voice their concerns or help them volunteer or engage in their community on a broader level. And here I'd like to share just some numbers that uh, were shared with me, which is that the Squamish Off-Road Cycling Association has 3,400 members at the time that um, the interview took place. And that's about 15% of the community. And this is just the mountain biking community. This doesn't include the climbers, the windsurfers, or any of the other outdoor recreation activities that Squamish has to offer. But this, I think, really illustrates um, how influential outdoor recreation can be in these communities. Our next community impact is um, economic impacts. And here I'll be talking about uh, three themes. The first is observed economic activities. So throughout all of the interviews, participants were able to directly identify uh, economic opportunities that came because of the outdoor recreation sector. So this includes outdoor recreation stores, bike shops, but it goes further into tourism, hospitality, even food and beverage. Uh, the participants all linked these uh, economic ac activities directly to outdoor recreation. The next theme is that outdoor recreation is a selling point. And this is a selling point for people to come to the community. It's a selling point for businesses to come to the community. And it's, um, it's what a lot of these communities uh, can can offer and it's being intentionally used as a, as a selling point. And the final one is outdoor recreation as an economic diversification strategy. So uh, through these interviews, I talked to some economic development officers and something that drew my attention was that outdoor recreation is being intentionally used as an economic diversification strategy. And uh, this is significant in rural communities uh, where they might be more reliant on a certain industry. And so having outdoor recreation creates more diversity and creates more resilient uh, economies. And uh, as I mentioned, the goal of this research wasn't to quantify impact. Um, and this is not an economic impact system in any way. However, we did hear some numbers about the economic impact, and these are just numbers that came up through the interviews naturally. We did not ask about them, but they did come up, and I'd like to share because I think it can really help illustrate what outdoor, the economic impacts that outdoor recreation is having. So the first one is uh, for Revelstoke, which is a hub for heli skiing. I was told that uh, BC holds around 85% of the international market share uh, or of, of heli skiing. And the heli skiing industry alone provides 326 million in total economic output to BC's economy. And that's just one activity alone. Next is Topino's tourism, which is motivated by outdoor recreation. It generates 240 million in direct economic output. In Squamish, we heard that there's 188 local businesses in the outdoor recreation sector, which employ around 364 local workers and about 94, 94 of those companies are directly involved in mountain biking. The Burns Lake Outdoor Recreation Store, Woods and Water, had one person working at the store in 2017, and in the summertime, 
and now they have nine. So this again speaks to some of the growing interest in outdoor recreation, or maybe it speaks to the growing demand in outdoor recreation goods. And finally, for Fernie, we heard that the Elk Valley Economic Initiative reported that outdoor activities and recreational opportunities was the top strength for a community as a place to do business. So pretty interesting. All right. And the next uh, community impact that we heard about is on housing and migration. So outdoor recreation um, attracts people to live in the community and it also motivates them to stay in the community. And we heard that this can influence some of the demographics in the communities. For example, Tofino has a much younger uh, demographic than is common in on the island. Uh, Fernie has, um, I heard about 30% of homeowners are second homeowners from Alberta who are coming to Fernie for their outdoor recreation um, amenities. Uh, and while that the this interest in the in these communities can be good and it shows the value that these communities have. There's also a downside and um, it was related to affordability. Uh, I do wanna say housing and affordability are very out of the scope of this project. And I just wanna talk about how um, affordability issues are impacting the outdoor rec se sector. Um, because as these communities become less affordable, the people that are helping maintain the outdoor spaces and that built and developed um, the outdoor recreation sector um, may no longer be able to afford their community. And so that could lead to changes in demographics and to the way that outdoor recreation um, assets are managed in their communities. <clears throat> and the next one here is on strain on community infrastructure. So uh, we've talked a little bit about how outdoor recreation can attract tourism and attract visitors. Uh, but when there are too many visitors, uh, sometimes even the community infrastructure itself isn't able to keep up as well as um, residents would like. Um, and some concerns that uh, were discussed were, for example, for emergency management services uh, like search and rescue, um, even down to sewage and Tofino. I think the overall comment here is that these are small communities with limited capacities, and if they're not repaired to, to handle the number of people coming, uh, it can cause um, strains and uh, frustrations for residents. So uh, I think there's an opportunity there to, to better support communities. All right, so those are our community impacts, and I'm going to move on to our final section here of results and discussion, uh, which is about barriers, challenges, and a few other discussions. Uh, and these are uh, topics that came up during the interviews, sometimes within the first 10 minutes of an interview. Um, and I'd like to share some of the concerns that the um, interviewees shared with me. And the first is limited capacity for land managers, uh, specifically recreation sites and trails, BC and BC parks were very commonly mentioned. Uh, community members are um, seeing and recognizing that the land managers do not have the capacity to handle the amount of outdoor recreation um, demand that is coming their way. The next is limited funding, which is part of the capacity issue for land managers, but it's also um, stems down to those outdoor recreation groups that are volunteer led. They might have volunteers that are interested in working on those uh, outdoor recreation issues, but don't have funding to, to work on those projects. The next theme here is complex issues and complex processes. So as we have seen throughout this, uh, this presentation, there's lots of things that are going into the outdoor rec sector and there's lots of values to consider, um, namely environmental values and cultural values. And so as we become more aware of them, I think we're better suited to help protect them and preserve them. But that also means there's extra steps to take and these steps are very important but it is extra work. And that leads to the next one, which is an over-reliance on volunteers. Because if your land managers don't have enough capacity, then a lot of the work falls on the hands of volunteers and they are being asked to manage complex issues and complex processes. Um, and there are definitely some questions on whether volunteers should be, uh, uh, should be relied on as much. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, there, the next point here, number five, no plan or vision, was uh, people expressed that they would like to see more planning and more visioning for how outdoor recreation is used in their communities. 
Number six, limited research and data is about how uh, there is limited research and data on outdoor recreation. And this can limit how people um, can make informed decisions to um, help manage and protect these areas. And the final point here is what is outdoor recreation? Uh, this was an interesting conversation that emerged and it was people talking about how uh, outdoor recreation may be a bit of a limited view, um, especially if you consider activities like fishing, hunting or berry gathering. These could also be considered sustenance activities or they may be um, culturally significant traditional activities. Uh, so is outdoor recreation the best use of that? The other question about what is outdoor recreation uh, relates to what is the outdoor recreation sector? How does it extend? How do we define it? Uh, those are some, some questions that emerged there. Now I'm just going to jump right back into this land impact slide that we saw earlier, because I want to point out how some of those or most of those barriers and challenges are impacting the organized uh, outdoor recreation sector. And I want to highlight again um, how they are benefiting and enhancing some of these um, impacts that uh, positive impacts that exist. Um, and I think if you come to look at, at this slide again, one to six, you can see that a lot of these are directly impacting the organized recreation sector, and it uh, limits their ability to um, address challenges and provide opportunities or make the most of what they have uh, in their communities. So just something to think about. So. We've gone over challenges, we've seen impacts. So what's next? Well, I outlined a couple of recommendations based on this interview data um, that I think might be some next steps to take a look at as, um, as a sector. First is to measure and prove the impacts of outdoor recreation. So as I mentioned, this study is not quantitative, it's completely qualitative. And uh, we are not measuring the impacts. Uh, it's more of an outline of the impacts and showing how everything is interconnected and how um, and, and starting to identify what some of those impacts might be. The more research is needed to uh, really define what that is and, and, and to measure it. Uh, the next is to test management solutions. Um, so something that uh, I notice is that a lot of the uh, members of the community or different communities are facing very similar challenges. And so I wonder if we might be able to test management solutions in certain areas and then uh, share the, the knowledge um, that we learn from them to uh, on behalf of how effective they are and if they are uh, management solutions that are addressing the challenges um, adequately. Supporting local key players is another key recommendation. Um, this was something else that really stood up from the interviews. It was how much people really care about these places, um, especially locals. And I think they're already doing a fantastic and incredible job of um, supporting their outdoor spaces, of volunteering, of doing as much as they can to protect them. And um, I think a bit of support um, their way can go a long way into, uh, into continuing to build a positive, um, a positive space. Next is to establish relationships and collaborate. Uh, so throughout the interviews, I noticed that on most or if not all the um, successful projects and positive initiatives uh, were uh, really established thanks to relationship building and collaboration. And um, again, I think this presentation shows how interconnected outdoor recreation is to uh, economies, to tourism, and to all these different areas. And so I think a question we should be asking is how can we build relationships between each other? How can we collaborate? And these communities are all doing a, are already doing a fantastic job of doing this. So I think there's a lot to learn there from them. And the last one is proactively plan. Uh, and I already talked a little bit about planning and visioning, so I will just a bit of that. All right, so just some key findings to summarize what we talked about today. Uh, so the first is there's three similarities in the outdoor recreation sector of the five communities. That's easy access to outdoor recreation. Uh, the There are the first one. The second one is there are outdoor recreation assets. Sorry. And the third is there are people that are accessing those outdoor recreation assets. And that's sort of the basis of an outdoor recreation sector, in my opinion. And next is that there are negative impacts and they are primarily human caused, but they can be managed. 
Evidence from these interviews suggests that through monitoring and, man and active management, uh, these impacts can be reduced or uh, eliminated. Uh, Third, the sector struggles to manage negative land impacts. So we saw all of the barriers that the uh, that the sector is facing, and um, some of the challenges that come with having a really great outdoor recreation sector in a small community. For the sector's organization provides or enhances benefits. So again, we saw how the organized outdoor recreation sector, so your land managers, outdoor recreation groups, and volunteers. First Nations and even destination marketing organizations provide or enhance benefits that um, that can come of the outdoor recreation sector. Five is the community capacity to address challenges is limited. So again, communities are small, their capacity is limited, and so their ability to address challenges can be limited. Negative impacts, barriers, and challenges are threats. And lastly, collaboration and coordination enable positive benefits. All right. And I'll just move on to some closing remarks here. So the question we asked at the beginning of this presentation and at the beginning of the, the research is, what are the impacts of outdoor recreation for rural BC communities? And I would really suggest that these impacts are far reaching and widespread. I think there's lots of positive impacts, but at the same time, there's negative impacts that we should recognize. And uh, they require a careful balancing and definitely require our attention. I'm going to share just a couple quotes to wrap up this presentation, and I, these are quotes that I really uh, enjoyed from the interviews, and that I think um, showcase some of the sentiments and themes that I talked about today. The first is, everybody is pretty much saying the same story. Yes, we understand. Yes, it's important. We have no money to do more. We have no more staff, and this is the challenge. And the next is, in addition to the positives, there are negatives. We need to face it all. We need to keep our eyes wide open to figure out how we are going to do this together. Thank you so much. So that wraps up my presentation here. Uh, I'd also just like to say, if you enjoyed the presentation today um, and would like to support ORCBC's work, uh, you can consider joining as an ORCBC member, uh, donating or sponsoring a future webinar or um, other event. And Soraya has put some information in the chat if that is of interest to you. And I will jump right into questions. So I see there is a chat box and a Q&A, so I'll um, encourage you to put your questions in either one of those. And I'll start with the chat, I think. So let's see. Um, so Michelle's asking, which impacts of outdoor recreation do you think would be the most would be most important to focus on in future research? Mm, that's a great question. Something that came up is in, through these interviews is that um, people uh, mentioned that we don't have a really a great understanding of capacity and how much an outdoor recreation um, space can handle to, until it reaches that capacity. So at what point um, does it become for place, uh, for outdoor space to be too much to handle? I think that is a really uh, important research question that we should be looking at. What is the capacity of these outdoor recreation spaces? Um, did interviewees identify any management solutions that are being tried? Um, I, we didn't focus on management solutions too much during the interviews, but they did come up naturally. Um, I recall a conversation about how um, active monitoring um, in a really busy outdoor recreation space in Tofino um, directly uh, led the land managers to seeing uh, less negative impacts throughout a season. Um, so I think active monitoring and, and management is a management solution that's probably already been tested. And I think it would be great to kind of see, know how effective that is, what type of uh, monitoring and education is the most uh, useful, um, and, uh, and how much more of it do we need. Uh... Rico says, would you be able to show the key finding slide again? And yes, I'll leave that up there. One second. Yep. Okay. 
the presentation will be shared. Yes, it will be shared. Um, and I will be sending out the recording as well. So you'll receive a follow-up. Anyone that has registered for this webinar will receive a follow-up email with the recording of the webinar and will also receive um, the slides. All right, I'm moving on to the Q&A part now. Uh, so Jennifer says, what do you hope other than future research comes out of the study slash report? I think it, I'd point back to that collaboration piece. I feel that a lot of communities, um, although the details are different, are facing very similar challenges. And I think um, knowledge sharing and sharing experiences can really go a long way um, to, to, um, to providing some positive outcomes for communities. And I think there's also a lot to be learned from these organizations that have done really a fantastic job of um, of already collaborating and um, within their community, and I think that we can really expand on that. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Diane is next, and if our town becomes a member of ORCBC, what are the costs and benefits? Uh, so ORCBC, we have a yearly membership fee, and um, you become becoming one of our members um, helps us uh, represent the outdoor recreation sector better or as well as communities. Um, and so it really increases our voice and our advocacy efforts. And uh, other benefits include um, helping us choose or, or helping us um, shape the direction um, of outdoor recreation, uh, of the outdoor recreation sector, what areas need more focus and, uh, and it adds your voice to our voice. Uh, Ian says, as much as funding is a challenge, I would suggest that the lack of multi-year funding models restricts organizations' abilities to be forward thinking. Yep, that's a great comment. I, yep, I totally agree. That was a comment I'm, I'm hearing quite a bit too now. Uh, Michelle says, would you say that communities where you did the interviews are generally optimistic or pessimistic about their ability to benefit from outdoor recreation and minimize negative impacts? Uh, I think they are, I, I would, I want to say generally, uh, no, generally optimistic. Um, I think the there is just such a, uh, what came across really to me is how much people care about these outdoor spaces and how much they're willing to um, invest and take care of them. I think the negative impacts and the barriers and challenges that came across in the interviews uh, were not necessarily them being pessimistic, but um, just showing their frustrations be um, with regards to how some of these challenges are currently not being addressed or being addressed. And um, I think... Um, the concerns that were expressed um, are, are um, things that these communities are looking at addressing. So for example, in Fernie, um, the uh, for Tourism Fernie and um, a few other organizations, which I'm blanking on right now, are working on a sustainable tourism project and they are doing research on the um, impacts of outdoor recreation, especially for wildlife. Um, and they are they are piloting a community ambassadors program. So there's the, these communities, I think, are trying really hard to, to work on this. And I think they recognize that they have something really special on their hands and are uh, really eager to, to help protect them. All right, uh, our next comment here. Hi, Jimena. Did interviewees mention how destination marketing slash management organizations are meeting and are missing the needs of the outdoor rec recreation communities in their area? Okay, this is a great question. I'm super uh, excited to answer this one, actually. Uh, so one of the main concerns that came with destination marketing is a place that's being marketed before it's ready to, um, to take on the amount of uh, people that are expected to come in. So uh, one of the things that people suggested was more um, consultation with the land managers. So before a place is marketed, that they be the land managers be consulted to ensure that that place has enough resources 
um, and enough infrastructure to manage the number of people that might be coming in, into that area. I also think that uh, destination marketing can play a really, really big role in the education piece. So we heard about how human caused damages can come from a lack of knowledge. And I think um, destination marketing can be a really important piece in making sure the right resources are in the right hands of the people that are going to these outdoor spaces. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, um, the destination marketing organizations, especially in Fernie and uh, Revelstoke, are already working on some destination management and, um, and trying to address the needs of their community. Uh, and they can sometimes be restricted but with how tourism funding can be used. Um, and sometimes they're not necessarily, to my understanding, um, are not necessarily able to funnel um, tourism funding directly into outdoor recreation, which is something that they sometimes have to work through creative solutions to try to, to get there. So, for example, Revelstoke has campaigns that encourage uh, fundraising for uh, local outdoor recreation groups. Mm -hmm. okay. Our next question here is, did communities raise any policy or regulatory roadblocks to, to sustaining or expanding outdoor recreation? Uh, so something that was discussed um, are authorization processes, which, as I mentioned, are an important part of, of um, your outdoor recreation uh, sector and maintaining some of those values. Um, but uh, a lot of the people, or oftentimes volunteers, might be the ones that are filling in these um, applications and processes, and sometimes they're just a little bit too complicated for them. So I, I wonder um, if through policy or other regulatory uh, initiatives that can be addressed. Um, yeah, I think that'd be it. And um, in Burns Lake also, um, it was discussed that um, uh, how to, how can we bring in more economic benefits from outdoor recreation? And, um, and that funding issue was also mentioned. So another policy um, that could help um, would be possibly um, more funding from like uh, governments or districts uh, towards uh, outdoor recreation initiatives. I think that, that could also go a long way. Sarah asks, uh, did you ask what types of recreation are being participated in within the communities? Curious if horseback riding was pre prevalent in any of these communities. I did not ask about outdoor recreation um, activity participation. Uh, and some activities came up more than others um, in certain communities. So there's definitely standout ones like uh, in Tofino, for example, surfing, right? <laughs> but I know there's a lot of other activities that exist there, but we didn't really dive deep into what type of activities are in each community. Mm. Abby's asking, did carrying capacity come up in the interviews at all, i.e. capping access to certain areas to reduce impact? Uh, yes, it did come up. Um, and one of the concerns with um, uh, capping access or completely closing off access is actually people just not listening to those signs. And I heard of a couple of times, like people don't listen to signs. Um, so I, I think it's something that is being tested. I imagine it's probably effective in, in some places, but I did hear that uh, maybe in a couple of in instant instances, it wasn't. Um, yeah. Is this report going to be shared with Destination BC? The report is available online at orcbc.ca. I will also share it in the follow-up uh, email. If you look for it on the website, it's under our um, resources um, tab, and I will share uh, a link to it as well after this webinar. Did anyone talk about lack of coordination among land managers as a challenge? Uh, no, that wasn't, uh, I guess it was discussed uh, indirectly. Um, so in Fernie, there's a lot of private land uh, managers. And one of the challenges that Fernie faces is um, uh, is needing a lot of um, authorizations from different land managers and coordinating them. So one trail network might be running through lots and lots and lots of, um, of different areas. And so um, in that way, um, that the that's from the, 
the Fernie Child Alliance, they are managing that, I guess, coordination, uh, which again, Fernie Child Alliance is a nonprofit organization that um, has lots and lots of volunteer hours. So um, yeah, I, I think it really speaks to some of that value that comes there. David Oliver says, people need to go talk to their local MLA and let the MLA know that more money is needed for land managers and for outdoor recreation. Uh, yes, thank you, David. I totally agree. I think um, we need to be loud about this and, and let um, our MLAs and other representatives know that, um, that this is something that needs to be supported. Um, and, and again, I, I point to that organized sector slide where you can see how all of these benefits are really multiplied by the organized sector. And so I think it's really important that we support it best we can. Um, all right, our next question. Any recommendations for land, water managers, et cetera, for canoe group size? Uh, no, unfortunately not. I. Oh, I'm definitely not the right person to ask about that. So sorry, James, but I don't have an answer for you on that one. Uh, Aaron says, can you elaborate on who are land managers in a community? Yeah, uh, so land managers here, I'm referring to um, the uh, people in organizations that are uh, in charge, well, let's say in charge of the land or actively managing it. Um, and this co most commonly is uh, BC Parks, Recreation Sites and Trails BC, um, and First Nations. And so I'd say land managers are those with the authority to, um, to authorize what happens on, on the land. And uh, yeah, but that's, that's what I'd say are land managers. All right, I think, let me check the chat again. Uh, All right, any contact with experiential education school groups like Take a Hike? Uh, I don't, no, I don't think so. Um, no, I'd like to learn more about them. Um, and through the these interviews, I, I just, every time I came out of an interview, I came with two or three more people than I came out with two or, th two or three more people that I wanted to interview and more areas to explore and more topics to look at. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we were limited in, in how, uh, how deep this research could go. And so um, I think it'd be really great if we could um, expand into lots of different areas and, and dive deeper into some of these topics. All right, I think I have answered all the questions. Is there any, are there any more questions here? Or would anyone like me to speak more about any of the topics that I um, addressed today? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I think that means I can wrap this up here. Um, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you coming out. I will be sharing the uh, report, the recording, and um, and uh, yeah, if you have any more comments or want to get in touch, please reach out. I uh, really learned a lot from this project. I really enjoyed it, and I hope you were able to learn as much as I did. I also really encourage you to read the report, although I did present on most of it today. Um, the report is uh, filled with all of these wonderful quotes from the interviewees, and it's just something that I personally can't capture as well as the people that are living um, in these communities and are living through these experiences. The interviewees did an amazing job of explaining all of these um, challenges, benefits, opportunities to me, and um, I tried to capture that as best I could in the report. And so if you have the time, I would highly, highly recommend um, you read it and please reach out with uh, any questions or, or comments. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you for joining me.